for the the next part of polarization. So we have Alejandra Jimenez Rosales, who's currently at Max Planck Institute, um, talk about magnetized accretion and the polarization we can get from that. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yep. OK, great. Um, right. Yeah, so thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. And good morning, good evening to all of you. Um, yeah, my name is Alejandra Jimenez Rosales. And yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about the research that I developed during my PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics with the infrared group. Um, so just as a little bit of a recap and, you know, taking a little bit from what Angelo just said, um, we care about polarization because, well, we study accreting black holes to learn about, yeah, plasma physics and to, you know, look around and test this strong gravity around the black holes. And so far we had been doing it with this unresolved polarization measurements because, yeah, we couldn't see the sources. Um, but now with the advent of gravity, which I show you down there in the middle and the Event Horizon Telescope EHT, now we are able to resolve these areas that are right outside the black holes. And so now we can, uh, we care about studying the spatially resolved polarization around them because yeah, polarization adds this new quote unquote dimension to the data and what we can learn about the system. So these accreting black holes, for example, would be the one at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star, so uh, up there at the top left, and also, yeah, the one at M87. Um, and so now we have better data, but we also have now better models that, well, we can now self-consistently evolve um, the electrons, and we can include all these other physics that make our calculations a little bit more accurate in a way. Um, and so, Again, the way to do this usually is by just you take a rotating black hole, you take this accretion flow around them, and uh, due to stresses in the plasma and the interactions with the magnetic field, there's this outwards transport of angular momentum such that the matter at each time gets closer and closer to the black hole. Um, and it can either cross the event horizon or be ejected in this powerful jets. Um, and so within this plasma, um, radiation is emitted, so synchrotron radiation. And with ray tracing techniques, we can look at these rays and see how they're doing as they're going across the accretion flow, right? So um, on the top right there, I show you this um, images panel where on um, the number one is just the total intensity, where in false colors, I just show you uh, where the lighter the, the, the shade, the more emission is coming from this region the darker, the less emission you're getting. And these images are um, given by this characteristic crescent shapes because, well, they're dominated by uh, general relativistic effects that so we have a lot of light uh, bending and we also have Doppler boosting and so on and so forth. And we can also look at what the polarization is doing. So there in panel two, I show you what we call the polarization map. So these white ticks characterize the direction of the polarization. Um, and their length is proportional to the linear polarization fraction in that pixel. Um, so polarization is actually very sensitive to what is happening in the plasma. So as Angela mentioned, we have this local um, emission and absorption, and we also have Faraday effects, which uh, as we just learned, they are this very sensitive um, tracer of the plasma properties. And so there are, uh, we can study sort of their effects on these spatial, um, the spatial configuration of the polarization. And we can learn about the plasma from these. So there I just mentioned some references on uh, work that has been focusing on, yeah, these uh, say scrambled versus ordered configurations and how you would get say linear depolarization from this scrambling and so. Um, but for my talk, I would like to focus a little bit more um, on the magnetic field, um, the influence of the magnetic field on the polarization patterns. So polarization direction is given by uh, the cross product between the 
the wave vector k and the magnetic field direction v. So right there, we can see the polarization is very sensitive to what the magnetic field is doing. So let's set aside the radiative transfer effects for now and then just focus on how magnetic field modifies what we would see um, that the polarization is doing. So I'll show you a couple of examples of how the polarization um, changes depending on the underlying magnetic field structure that you have. So let's start with uh, this toroidal field. So on the top left, uh, sorry, the bottom right, um, I show you a ray tracing calculation of just an optically thin medium that is just shining in this toroidal magnetic field. And you can see that the ticks have this radial pattern. And on the left, I show you this simple schematic where we can um, understand why this is happening. So if we have K that is pointing towards us outside the screen, uh, pointing towards this uh, outside of the screen, and B that is perpendicular, then you would expect this radial pattern all over um, the image. And this holds also for low and high inclinations. Um, we can also look, for example, at what a radial magnetic field would look like. And uh, now we can see that the polarization ticks are actually tracing um, like almost circles. Um, and an, and an interesting thing that happens is when we look at or compare with the this toroidal field, um, we can see that the radial and the toroidal are uh, very much related. Um, you only have to include like a phase offset in the ticks of say 90 degrees and you would go from one to the other. Um, another example would be with the vertical magnetic field. Now this one is a little bit trickier because, well, at high inclination, you would expect that B is pointing upwards, and so K can be pointing anywhere. But at high inclinations, you would expect that the polarization is constant and horizontal. Um, and at low inclinations, the, the wave vector would become parallel to the magnetic field. So in principle, by just doing K cross B, you would expect that your polarization would be zero, but instead you see this twisty azimuthal pattern. And the key there is that you have this black hole right there at the center. So there's this light bending that effectively breaks this degeneracy between K and B, and you no longer have zero polarization. So then just by looking yeah, at the magnetic field structure, you can go from toroidal uh, with this radial pattern or vertical with this twisted pattern. Um, and I put there this connection with weak fields and strong fields because, well, you would expect if you have a weak magnetic field that the vertical component of the field will be sheared with stresses in the plasma. And so effectively, you would end up with a dominant component that is just pointing in the toroidal direction. Whereas if you have a strong magnetic field, the vertical component will, quote unquote, survive and will be uh, just like drawn into the and build up at the event horizon. Um, so then the idea would be if I have a, an emission region that can sort of go around the black hole and sample this uh, polarization pattern in time, because I don't have any radiative transfer effects, then um, I would be effectively tracing the magnetic field configuration in time. And so this way we would turn the magnetic field into an observable. So here, for example, let's call this compact op optically thin emission region a hotspot. And then it's just going around the black hole and it's sampling this uh, polarization pattern and effectively the magnetic field in time. So uh, this is just a quick example of how, say, of between the difference between a toroidal and a vertical field and how they would look in time. Um, I'll, I'll show it to you in, in a moment. But just a quick reminder, so linear polarization is characterized by Stokes, Q, and U. And basically, they take this these um, values, right? So horizontal and vertical are represented by Q, and they go from the minimum to the maximum, and also the plus 45 and minus 45 degrees, you go from minus uh, the minimum of you and the maximum of you. So 
if we start with a toroidal field, and let's say that my emission region is there in position number one, then most of my vectors are going to be horizontal. So that means that, um, yeah, the, the, the most of my polarization is going to be a horizontal thick, such that I'm going to have a maximum in Q and a minimum in U. And so, uh, and U will be zero. So uh, there on the top right, I plot Q and U as a function of time. And underneath that, I have the Q and U space. So position one would give me a maximum in U and U uh, in Q, excuse me, and U equals zero. And so I will be there in both of these graph uh, plots. Now, if at a different time, my emission re region moves, then now I'll, I'll go, I would have sampled these vectors in time and now I would be in position number two, where I have a minimum in Q and uh, it would also be zero. And I can do this along the magnetic, uh, this polarization pattern um, all over the polarization pattern. And so as a hotspot is going around, it samples this sinusoidal curves and we would actually expect to see these two loops in QU space. If on the other hand, for example, we have a vertical magnetic field, then uh, very similarly to what we just did, we can also do that with, you know, at different points along this magnetic field. And now we see that, well, there's still wiggling in the curves, but it doesn't look like the toroidal field. And we also, we also just have um, one loop in Q and U space. So just by using these techniques, we can now, in a way, tell apart the vertical from the toroidal by looking at the evolution of the Stokes parameters with time. Um, and an idea that um, where we could apply this was actually for Sagittarius A star and the infrared flares. So Sag A star um, has this quiescent state where, I mean, it emits from radio all the way to X-rays. And the quiescent state is um, where most of the flux is emitted at the submillimeter. But um, Sag A star is very frequently flaring in the infrared and in X-rays. And by flaring, I mean that um, the flux in the infrared goes above the, the detection limit by a factor of say 10 or 20. Um, and it lasts for about 60 to 80 minutes. And this also happens in X-rays, but it's more a factor of 100 or so. Um, and so before we couldn't um, see this emission region or resolve it very well, um, but now with gravity, uh, we're able to do this. So gravity is this interferometer at the VLT in Chile that combines the light of these four massive UT telescopes um, and it operates at two micrometers. Uh, the baseline length is about 100 meters. And so this gives you an imaging resolution of 3 milliard seconds and an astrometry resolution from 20 to 70 microseconds. So with this um, information, gravity is able to resolve the areas that are very close to the black hole. And so in 2018, the Gravity Collaboration published a result where they um, analyzed this three bright flaring events from Sagittar. And um, by looking at this resolved emission region and how it moved, um, it seemed to be consistent with clockwise motion at scales of three to five Schwarzschild radii. Um, so this means that it was very close to, yeah, the right outside the black hole pretty much. And so there I show you the three flares from the paper. Uh, again, they last from 40 to 60 minutes and the, their fits there. Um, gravity also recorded polarization information uh, for the nights. And so um, on the left there, I show you the one for July 28th, where we have this relative flux in, in blue, I show you there on the left. And this it's this double peaked flare. But then the interesting thing with the polarization is that as the polarization evolves, there is this sign change in the polarization angle, this large swing, which is also consistent with um, something that is orbiting the black hole. 
and the polarization periods are also consistent with the astrometry. So this is even more supportive of the fact of the idea that it's something that is orbiting the black hole. And so there on the right, I just show you the data that we have for July 28th. And it's interesting to note that gravity measures can measure both Q and U, but it cannot do it simultaneously. So if we take this data and say, well, let's just simply interpolate between them and see what we get. Well, when we go to the QU space, it would seem that the data traces this one loop. Um, and so if we go back to the simple geometries that I was showing you at the beginning, we can go from a vertical loop, which is the one loop or the toroidal field. Um, and just from this, we could say that we should go for the vertical field. But then again, this was by saying, well, we have linear interpolation. Um, but we could we do better? And um, the answer is yes. So the way to do this is by forward modeling hotspot models. Um, the hotspot model is well motivated because of this um, astrometric motion and also the polarization angle swing um, to take just this simple hotspot that is going around the black hole, the toy model. Um, and with this forward modeling, we can explore a variety of idealized magnetic field configurations. We can create mock observations and um, by using this calibration of the instrument, we can uh, take our predicted curves, run them through, say, the gravity, uh, how gravity would see them, and then compare it to the data. And so this allows us to, um, well, first of all, we don't have to make any assumptions on what uh, the observed Stokes V is. So gravity doesn't measure any circular polarization. And going from what gravity sees to what would actually be in the source takes some assumption on the circular uh, polarization. Um, we also don't need to interpolate anymore between the gaps of data because we would have the data at every time. And we, um, with this forward modeling, we can also predict what both of the Stokes parameters would look like even when we have just measured one. So that's the power of this forward modeling approach. And we have applied it to the gravity flares. So now the idea is we have this hotspot going around the black hole. And so you have these parameters that are inclination, the distance at which the hotspot is, the size of the hotspot, and um, say the, the, the way we explore these different magnetic field configurations is to take the magnetic field as a superposition of a vertical component and a radial component. And the relative tilt between them will be this angle theta. So a theta of zero would give you a vertical field and a theta of 90 just gives you again this uh, the polarization pattern for the radial field. Um, and so applying this to the data gives us this where we have also used the constraints from the astrometry for the night. And um, basically the best statistical fit for the data means that we need to have moderate inclinations, but also and especially we need a combination of vertical field and a radial field. Um, from looking at the behavior of the data, the hotspot model in general uh, can, uh, explain the general behavior of the data is not perfect, but it kind of has the same uh, behavior. And as you can see now, there's a lot more wiggling. It's not just this linear interpolation between the medians. So now that, that gives us a little bit more, a more complex QU loop that I show you there on the right. Um, another result that we got was that um, our hotspot models overproduced the observed linear polarization fraction so in the hotspot model context, this would imply that the emitting area is uh, large enough to resolve the magnetic field structure. As in, in order to depolarize, you need to see, uh, you need to beam depolarize. Um, an, alternative to, an, an alternative to that would be that there is turbulence in the underlying field or something, but anyway. 
so that's um, that's one of that idea. And then we also tried, for example, a vertical plus toroidal field. Um, and in this case, we got also the same result where, um, yeah, we have this combination of a vertical component and a toroidal component. And this, the presence of this vertical component in the gravity data um, implies that we would have this dynamically important magnetic fields in the vicinity of Sag A star. Um, and so that, that was, yeah, very interesting. And so all along I've been saying that we associate this vertical component to um, strong magnetic fields and the toroidal to weak magnetic fields or so. Um, and just because, uh, yeah, from these uh, simple geometries that I was showing you, but can we actually get it from GRMHD? Well, that's a little bit, um, yeah, a little bit work in progress. This is from 3D, 3, uh, 3D GRMHD simulations. Uh, so on the left, we have this weak toroidal field where you have this radial um, pattern. On the right, you have this strong magnetic field, which kind of shows this twisty polarization uh, pattern as well. Um, so yeah, maybe it's like this radial or vertical. And um, the thing here is that, uh, so these are submillimeter images. Uh, in the infrared, the fact that the hotspot is optically thin and without very rotation is well motivated because yeah, we're in the infrared and so um, as Angela was saying, very rotation goes down with, uh, yeah, like lambda squared, well, inverse. So um, very rotation is negligible in the infrared. Um, and so here in the submillimeter, we do have to worry a little bit more about Faraday effects, but hopefully uh, spatially resolved information from the EHT uh, will soon come and with this way we can prove the magnetic field at different uh, scales. And we can, yeah, uh, use it as a complementary study as well with uh, what gravity is doing and what gravity has achieved. Um, and with this, I'd like to leave you with my summary and yeah, the outlook. Um, so gravity flares have resolved the, this plasma dynamics at event horizon scales. And with the hotspot model, uh, it's possible to turn this magnetic field into an observable. Uh, the hotspot model uh, broadly, uh, yeah, is consistent with the overall behavior of the data and both polarization and astrometry imply that we have uh, dynamically important magnetic fields around Sag A star. And yeah, this complementary studies with the HT will be very important. And that's, that's all, thanks. Thank you. So let's see. Um, first, we'll take questions just pertaining to this talk before we kind of break out into a more broader discussion. Um, so let's see. Are there any questions for Alejandra? Uh, yes, Kushik. Um, very nice talk, Alejandra. Uh, I was just wondering about the uh, hotspot models that you use for gravity. Were, were those hotspots um, constrained to the mid plane or were they uh, helical, helically moving hotspots? Right, so these ones were just uh, in the mid plane, yeah. Okay, and uh, how do you think the, Im um, the image would change if you had helical hotspots? Hmm. Mm. Yeah, I guess it would depend maybe on what the underlying field for this in this helical motion would be. As in, maybe if it's helical motion, then maybe it's moving in a say a jet or so, and maybe you mm -hmm. would um, you would expect yeah a more um, yeah toroidal field or so. So and so that would change then how you see the. Yeah, these Stokes parameters with time, I guess. Um, so yeah, we don't know from these flaring um, scenarios, we don't know exactly where the emission is coming from, right? Um, mm -hmm. 
so yeah it would be interesting to to yeah to learn that namely thanks okay uh very very nice talk alejandra um i my question was also quite similar to kaushik's um you said that the polarization um is implies that the um, model of the hotspot orbiting the black hole is is consistent with what you're seeing. So it's it would be interesting to understand what aspect of that is is giving rise to the consistency, so that you could extend to models where the hotspot isn't necessarily orbiting um, in the midplane, but along the lines of what Koshek was asking, having the flexibility mm -hmm. to move um, in a helical motion. So yeah. Um, it, it would it would be nice to um, just extend your forward modeling and also um, understand what what in the magnetic field structure is dominating the polarization signal. So one question I had um, in the context of the model you have so far, is it fair to say you would expect any future observations? with gravity, for instance, to kind of show the same thing, like, you know, the, the, how it traces out the path in the QU plane, is that something you kind of expect to be constant if we keep looking at it? Um, right, so the, the more flares we have, the better statistics we have, right? Um, unfortunately for these 2018 flares, um, so only July 28th has both Stokes parameters uh, measured for the one night. The other ones only have one Stokes parameter. Um, so even though we could, in principle, with this forward modeling, um, yeah, like predict what the other Stokes parameter is doing and try to see if it fits the data, um, it's not that uh, restrict restrictive. Uh, or easier to, to restrict the, the parameters. So, so far, the only uh, flare that we have with both Stokes parameters is this one that I presented to you. There are more uh, measurements for uh, 2019, um, but gravity uh, is, let's say, the way that gravity was taking data in 2019 was different to how it was observing in 2018. So there is a little bit of different systematics that you need to take into account and calibrate, and the, we're still working on that. Yep. Okay, thanks. Sorry, if I could add one thing, I think the important thing is that um, in the other flares where you only measure Stokes Q information, as we call it, this Q prime that Alejandro showed, um, we do see evolution in, in that Stokes parameter. And in particular, we see that it changes sign in basically all the cases of flares that we have. So yeah, right. I totally agree with Alejandro's point that it's hard to understand like how much is the pattern changing and that type of thing. But it does seem like there's evolution of polarization that's consistent with this picture of, of um, similar time scale if you were to make that into a period in all the cases that we've been able to observe so far. It may be getting into a discussion point, but my question for, for Ferry all, um, Bart at all would be, in a reconnection plasmoid scenario, you'll have some, you know, depending on the guide field, you'll have some evolution of the magnetic field itself, right? Bart showed like a factor of five dip. So the models that Alejandro showed, there's no, the, the only changes in the polarization signal are from moving through a background, right? So I think it'd be very, to turn that question back on you, it'd be very interesting to know what does reconnection predict for the evolution? You know, Should these swings in polarization just be from intrinsic changes rather than motion through a background, for example? I don't know the answer to that. Um, we haven't modeled the polarization, um, but um, I missed one thing you were saying. You, you're wondering about what's evolving uh, in the, the the background field could could certainly evolve if you're moving making a helical motion. Um, that that's what you're asking, right? Not not some other effect. Yes, yeah, so I think I mean so Alejandro's answer is right. I think that the the way that 
helical motion would change things would be depending on what the background field is in our current model. Mm -hmm. But in a reconnection scenario, the, the local field, at least when you first accelerate, um, the magnetic field itself could be changing, right, dynamically. Oh, I see. I we're, see. Not, we're not including that at all, right? We have, oh, we have a nice oh, oh, oh. blob like going around um, in a constant geometry, assuming that it's totally decoupled. And maybe that's okay if you like accelerate over here and then you just move out from there. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah, that's that's in the injection time scale is really fast compared to the dynamics. Um, so I don't want to call it orbital time scale because it's not really making an orbit, but the trajectory is traced out on a much longer time scale where cooling is important, but the injection is practically instantaneous compared to everything else that's happening. So if we are talking about repeated injections, um, that, that um, give rise to the flare, then absolutely your question about what is the background field doing, are the guide fields changing, et cetera, that would be very pertinent. But the picture that we had in mind is some large plasmoid, sort of what Bart sees in his simulations forms and contains the, the, the accelerated particles and that moves in a helical motion. So cooling would change that behavior. I, I agree with uh, what Fariel says, and that's also what we largely observe. And, and sort of what, what maybe surprised us that the actual hotspot that we're talking, that, that I am talking about, is not a single plasmoid, but it's sort of a region where many small plasmoids have bumped into. So, and those plasmoids, the, the, the small ones, they form on very sm fast time scale, as Fariel says in an um, anti-parallel magnetic field. But once they bump into the jet sheath, that field might be completely ordered and not anti-parallel, and it might be helical, et cetera. So, so the background field where the hotspot forms versus to the background field where the plasmoid forms might be very uh, different. And on top of that, you probably expect some turbulent field inside the hotspots because all those plasmoids, they are sort of, they have, they have uh, like like helical or, or circular magnetic field that sort of contains them, all those little like blobs of, of circular field that bump into each other and make a turbulent field inside the hotspot probably. So so I, I would say it's very complicated, but I agree with what Fariel said. And Bart, you mentioned in your talk very briefly that the motion of the plasmoids could be completely decoupled from like Keplerian rotation or anything that disk is doing. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, is there any reason to suspect that these plasmo, the, the big merged plasmoid would be moving along with the plasma or could it just be something like on a complete, not even a non-Keplerian orbit that's completely different than anything that's going on in the background? Right, yeah, I think, I think again, this relates to what Ferriel said, like the injection of, the, of these plasmoids or or the emission of the plasmoids from the exhaust of the current sheet is very fast. So there is there is no reason to think why why these plasmoids should move with a disk or like in a Keplerian motion. They're, they're sort of, the moment they're emitted from the current sheet, they're objects of, of their own who might or might not move with a disk. Okay. And they consist of non-thermal particles as well, so. Right. The, That, that leads into another question that I sort of had for Andrew, if Andrew is there. Because like Ferriol showed all these, like these fits to the, these PIC simulations where you have properties of the non-thermal particles as a function of sigma and beta. And so like lots of people have taken, well, some people have taken similar approaches to heating of the thermal particles, the electrons and protons, but I believe Andrew has the possibility of doing the exact same thing for non-thermal particles because he has, as if I remember a couple of years ago, he may, he wrote or he implemented like actually evolving the non-thermal particles alongside with the thermal distribution, like on a grid cell by grid cell basis in the, in the simulation itself. And I don't remember seeing anything after the method paper. And I was wondering if there's any work going on with actually importing realistic models for the non-thermal particle acceleration. 
Uh, yeah, so that's, I think, definitely a path that I've, I've looked at but not made as much progress on as I wanted to. Um, recently, I've been looking more, I think, at evolving the distribution, less with sort of injection from from these bits to, to reconnection simulations and more with more simple things like second order Fermi. But, um, but yeah, I think we can definitely go back and, and do that. And I've run a few simulations, more simulations in 2D that, that use these the prescriptions in the ball at all paper, for example, um, but just haven't really gotten on track to analyze them as much. I think, spe especially in the context of, of polarization, it might be really interesting to, to go back to that. And to yeah, I agree. I've been curious for years now, ever since I saw, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I it is something I definitely am trying to reactivate. So, um, okay. this might be a great time to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I think just, we'll also hear a little bit about one effort in this direction tomorrow, right? I think Jordi Davilar did something similar, not not the same, but did something in the similar spirit yeah. of using the ball at all prescriptions and trying to calculate spectra at least. Yeah. I think we'll hear about that tomorrow. Yeah, I think that was a little bit more post-processing. Oh, I see, rather than evolving them. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. But still definitely interesting and yeah. progress versus like what we've done in the past. I think that could also give us a really good starting place for yes for a simulation that you know if we take some of Bart's I mean sorry not, well, Bart's work also is relevant but um some of Yordi's um, favorite simulations and um, and plug it in to, to an evolution type code and see what what differences come out of that. So I have a question. Um, well this this slide is up from Alejandro just on the fourth point. Is this saying, is this kind of a, a point in favor of if we're going to decide between sane versus mad for the galactic center? Is this saying it's probably mad or at least there's some evidence for it? Um, I'm not sure exactly. So I would say that, um, yeah, you do need at least statistically better, the data prefers to have a vertical component, but to go from just completely vertical, which is maybe what I would expect for a mat, then to, you know, this mix, then maybe it's something in between. Um, but yeah. Um, okay, I'm trying to, trying to get all the, uh, everyone should make a prediction, should put their, their name on one column or the other. And <laughs> some, some number of years we'll have to get together and decide. That. I feel like most people are coming down on mat. Or it's or it's Bart's thing, and it's and you know fairy owls, and yeah. it's a plasmoid going up in a jet, and we're not even seeing the bulk of the matter in the infrared. Right. right. I forgot. Yeah. Yes, I was going to ask. We don't, we don't know for sure what we're seeing. So anyway, yeah. I think there's some constraints on how much vertical motion you can actually have because it looks like a you know three quarters rotation. The flares look sort of like rotations on the sky, not. Helixes, but still, I, I think uh, the ball at all paper that, that Fairy Al showed makes a pretty convincing case you can get similar patterns with things which are not in the midplane, for example. Does anybody have an idea? That's because in jets, normally there's a transition between the field being or toroidal to poloidal once, it, once the jet accelerates enough. Does anybody have a feel for where that transition is, like at what radius, and whether it would the, the this a plasmoid like this would be able to reach that radius before dissipating. I'm not sure. Uh, this might be a very simulation dependent thing. I guess not. So Ro Sean, Ramesh was giving a webinar, I think just a week ago um, on accretion physics and he showed some really nice simulations of the space time dragging and how, how you form the fields um, that collimate the jets. I don't remember the transition radius, but I, I know where to find it. Um, okay. It was really compelling. Um, like, yeah, you, you form these fields and then you can't collimate jets just from the space-time frame dragging, but I'll find it. Okay, thank you. Because I'm just thinking about whether like, if, if it's traveling through the whole time it's traveling through the jet, it's going to be poloidally dominant or toroidally dominant field. 
then that could tell you something based on Alejandro's work, whether the polarization signature would make sense or not. But the transition might be at small enough radii where you don't have to worry about that. I'm not sure for a blend force Nyack jet, but a blend force pain jet would be toroidally dominated, like really close to the black hole, like a few RG or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is a bland for pain enough to explain, like, I don't know, we're talking about Sagittarius. Yeah, never mind. Getting my black holes mixed up. Sorry, what was the question? Is that oh, enough I, I, I stopped in the middle of the question because I, I was confused. I confused myself. All right, and since we're, I think, moving well into the, the discussion, I guess one kind of open question, because I know there's a lot of gravity and EHT people here. Um, what are the plans, if any, for simultaneous observing? I guess, and thank you again, Alejandra. Sorry. 